This week on the Corpus Animus podcast, we're talking about judging. We go in depth with things like movement standards, application of standards across the board. We hope you enjoy it. If you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Get better at the sport of CrossFit alongside some of the best athletes in the world in our online training program, The Design. Head over to our website, trainingthinktank.com backslash DSGN to learn more. All right, guys, today in the Corpus Animus podcast, we're going to be talking about judging, judging standards. We're going to be talking about some of the big problems that we've seen with judging. And I don't want to come off on this podcast as if we're like uh, saints have the answers or, or anything like that. We're just going to have a discussion about judging in the sport of CrossFit. I think it's really unique because we're one of the only sports that has in-person and an online component. And we're going to talk about the the differences between those and and just some of the problems that we've seen. So diving into it, Brandon, one of the first things that we wanted to talk about is just how grateful we are for judges in in-person competitions. You want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, just being one, being a judge in in-person competitions and not only in the sport of CrossFit, but I also, it takes me back to my days of doing YMCA basketball where I was a referee and how challenging that was to call fouls on how third long, graders. How long did you, <laughs> how long were you a YMCA it was, referee? It was a great summer job that paid me like a hundred dollars a day. Each, oh, wow. Yeah, I did it every single weekend for a while and it was fantastic. But I think about the the parents yelling at me, <laughs> their third grader out there on the court. And uh, that wasn't a foul. Yeah, I'm like, Dude, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I think that one of the things we wanted to get across is like, look, we get how challenging it is, but it's something that we need to look at to find a way to make it uh, easier for our judges to be able to judge objective standards and allow the sport to continue to grow. But if we look at any other sport, like people complain, people complained last night about the NBA referees calling fouls. People complain about, you know, umpires calling balls and strikes in baseball or, you know, refs in football calling a, a holding penalty. So you there should are, watch WWE. Sometimes <laughs> they have matches where the dude will hit them with a the chair and they look Oh the my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope the microphone picked that up. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Usually you can only hear like a very faint thing of Chris uh, talking, yeah. but but yeah, so, I mean, it is tough, but I think one of the things that, you know, that I'm all have always been grateful for is knowing how fast it is. Like remember going out to Wadapalooza and I'm doing squat snatches and they're having to call good reps, or no reps when you're doing touch and go snatches or pistols where one of my legs doesn't really work. So I'm trying to turn a little bit so they can't see it. And you know, it, it's tough for them in the heat of the moment. So, uh, I think that the first thing is obviously being thankful for what they do. I'm sure that for most judges, it feels like a really thankless job. You know what I mean? They're out there literally from first thing in the morning all the way until the evening. Most events, they don't have some sort of like judge rotation. I know at some of the bigger ones like Wadapalooza they do, but at most like local events, it's the same judges out there the entire time. It's exhausting. It feels thankless for them, I think. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like you've been at Wadapalooza, we've all been there. It's just like the loud music pumping in. It's a very stimulating environment and you have to be turned on for... 12 straight hours, like you miss one call, you're going to have the athlete in your face. You're going to have fans in your face. I've seen judges, like I've seen fans threaten to fight judges post event. Like you no. volunteered to get like challenged to a fight. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> Does it make any sense? <laughs> Why would you that. ever want to go into that? <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, I mean, we all are thankful for them and I mean, it's natural human behavior, I think, to complain about the judges. I mean, my dad and I complain about baseball umpiring on a daily Everybody basis. Everybody does, right? Yeah. right. That, that was kind of the point. And, and the technology, the ability to slow videos down just makes it worse. It's like, how could you not see that? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're watching it frame by frame, of course you can see that he didn't reach depth when he missed by half an inch. Well, I think that also kind of brings up the point that in our sport, we've got in-person judges who we're extremely thankful for. And then we have the internet judges, Yeah, right? Who I think I, I personally am a little less thankful for because they tend to, uh, they, they use the advantage of the video, you know, the video slow-mo. And they're like, look, in this one rep, rep number 745, 
you were not yeah, we, quite. Well, <laughs> th- well we, there's a distinction there, right? We have internet judges and yeah. then we have internet trolls and yeah, yeah, we have yeah. quite a few of those right. trolls. I'm, I'm probably conflating <laughs> the two right now. That's probably, it's a good point. We have plenty of those trolls that, for, that follow our training think tank YouTube page. Every <laughs> yeah. single throwdown. Just They're like, one these, comment. Yeah. these movements are so stupid. I'm like, come, come demo for us then. <laughs> like show us how it's done. Yeah. I think the first thing, kind of the first talking point that I'd like to dive into, especially in the sport of CrossFit is judging is hard enough, but when we write standards that make it even more challenging, it's only going to double down on the challenge that the judges have. Yeah. I think to, to your point there, the best thing we can do is create standards that set our judges up for success for sure, rather than creating arbitrary standards that just make it challenging to judge and challenging to uphold. Yeah. I think what happens is that we, they're trying to find a standard that makes it challenging that to test the fitness level of the athletes. Right. But what happens is that then there are so like the handstand pushup standard is a perfect one. Mm-hmm. And I, Kyle, I know you and I have gone back and forth on this, but regardless of what we think about the standard, it's very hard to see if someone's foot goes over this tiny chalk line. And especially if you're a judge, that's a friend of the person that's in the competition or on site, whatever it may be, you're talking about like millimeters over the line. And then I have to say good rep or bad rep within half a second before they do their next one. And so are there other ways that we could do a handstand push-up standard like that to make it easier for the judges and still test fitness in the sport? Yeah, I don't think we're here to suggest new standards right now, but yeah. I think you're you're spot on in that coming up with ways to make like a wall ball is very obvious, right? Here's the line on the target. Make sure the ball touches the target, doesn't touch anything else, and make sure you get below parallel. That's an easily judged standard, which is why it's successful and used in competition quite a bit. But things like handstand push-ups, the lockout on ring muscle ups coming up with ways to have a consistent standard that everyone can uphold easily and that a judge can easily identify a no rep, I think is really important. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the answer to some of those questions. I know I actually came under quite a bit of fire for Mike's handstand pushups in one of the open workouts. And one of the other things to realize is like the perspective that you have, mm, right? So like, point. If one leg is higher than the other and I'm on the side with the higher leg, it looks good. So then again, like he is clearing on one side. Is he not clearing on the other? So yeah. And the camera still plays a role in that. So like Chris is at a different angle and he's videoing it. It's the same thing with like a wall ball. So a wall ball is a super easy thing to see, right? But if you have your camera on the floor behind you, it's going to look like, especially someone like me, who's like barely reaching depth, like I'm three inches over depth you know, or, or higher than I should be. But if I, if I have the camera up high looking kind of 45 degree angle down, it's going to look like every single one I'm three or four inches below where I need to be. So like you're saying, perspective definitely changes. And for the judge, no matter where they stand, we talked about the pistol example. And I said that jokingly about myself, but I've seen people in competitions that left leg is still above parallel, right leg is perfect. And they'll keep turning as their judge turns so that they only see their right leg, right? Like that's just the way that people do it. That begs the question also is like, what is good judging? Is good judging being able to like automatically identify every no rep every single time? Or is good judging just like being consistent with the way that you apply the standard to the athletes? Well, I think that we, that's probably a conversation that we're going to have kind of down the road in the podcast. But yeah. that the big question for me there is it's less about what good, well, it's all about what good judging is, but it's less about that person being consistent with just kind of like their, this is an air squat, this is a wall ball and consistent from athlete to athlete. If they're like a fan boy or girl of whoever they are judging. And, and I say that because we've seen this in competition too, where I love Noah. I love Matt. I love Tia Toomey. And so because of that, I'm judging them. I'm going to let them get away with some reps that maybe I wouldn't if it's just the normal person, in the intermediate division. We've seen that at Wadapalooza. Like there's no way that that's a rep, but they give them every single rep. And so when you have judges that, and we'll get into this, but aren't paid that haven't legitimately gone through any educational standards to see what they should be judging that are out there volunteering, the only way a human being is going to do that is based on empathy, right? And, and what I mean by that is like, if I like that person, I'm going to probably let them get away with a little bit more than maybe I should. And so that's something that we have to address. But going back to the standards, just real quick, not to ramble on this, I think one of the things that we should look at is trying to replicate, and I say this all the time, other sports. What they do every single year is they have their governing body, which hopefully CrossFit's starting to do. It seems like things are changing for that. And then have the athletes union come together and come up with better standards. So it's just a revision of each year's past failures to make them better and better and better so that in five, six years, it looks really good. That's a really good system for improving the sport every single year, where rather than taking the standards that you have and saying, we're going to completely erase these and just 
completely rewrite the rule book every single year and completely re- rewrite the standards every single year instead of taking that approach where you just make micro adjustments every year. Yep. If, if HQ had done that from the beginning, from, from the very inception of the sport to now, we would likely have handstand pushup standards that we wouldn't be sitting here saying are impossible to enforce as a judge. Now, the key to that real quick is you have to have the athletes in on totally, that conversation totally because agree. they're the ones that are doing it. And then they can also be honest, as honest as they can be about what the standards test. Uh, Ryan, you probably know this better than, than me. I know football, they change every single year. What, what does baseball do on a yearly basis to kind of adjust the rules? So baseball is in a weird situation with their umpires where the umpires actually have a union yep. and there are guys who are just untouchable. Yeah. Like all of them are untouchable. So there are guys who grade out with like strike zone misses at like 75%, which like the strike zone stays relatively the same. Like the baseball physique is somewhere between five foot 10 and six foot two for like 95% of the players in the league. So like, it's pretty consistent and you see guys missing two, three inches off the plate and there's no recourse yeah. at all. Um, they do give them grades and you see the younger guys get better, but like the old guard just isn't changing. So with that, like, honestly, it's kind of a stuck in their ways sport. Yeah. Well, with the NBA and the NFL, they definitely, they have standards in place. And then those, those refs or umpires aren't, they, they aren't, doing the biggest games on, on the biggest stage each week. So in other words, like the NBA, the rest that you, I don't know about this year with the bubble situation, but the rest that are in the playoffs were the rest that had the best calls in the season. So basically they're taking their best judges and pulling them into the playoffs where it actually matters and saying, this is, these are the people that we want judging this game. And so I think that's one of the things that we can do in this sport is finding an elite set of judges, just like we find an elite you know, level of, of competitor and say, you're judging when the stage matters the most. That's definitely going to take some groundwork from HQ because defining what th- this is what I was kind of getting at before yeah. is defining what a good judge is versus a bad judge is a- honestly a challenge. Like, you know, I, I just got through the master's fitness collective championships and I would say that I had great judging all weekend. Why would I say I got, gr- I had great judging? Cause I didn't have any, uh, I, I didn't have no reps called when I wouldn't agree with the no rep. I got no reps. I did have no reps called when it was legitimately a no rep. Yeah. Like, the, the calls seem to match my experience, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that was good judging. It was just that the judging met my expectations. And so I think coming up with a way to consistently grade judges, like Ryan, Ryan was saying, grading the pitchers, right? But grading the, the judges, I think, would be one way to start to, to move towards a better judging system for the sport. Take that and couple it with a system for upgrading the standards every single year. Not just rewriting standards, but upgrading the standards, taking input from athletes, input from coaches, input from uh, judges, and taking all of that information and using that to create a better sport every single year. That seems like a much better way to approach it than what we have had up to this point. Yeah, I, I think we would agree. And this isn't always perfect, but the first step for that would be having paid judges that are on staff. And it, it doesn't have to be, this is your full-time job and you're getting a yearly salary, but hey, you're on retainer or something like that to where you're doing these major competitions. So if sanctionals remains over the, the course of the next few years, or maybe not, it's- even if it is regionals. Even if it's regionals, yeah. either way, CrossFit is employing a set of judges that are doing the elite competitions competition. So male, female, and team that, Hey, you're paid to fly to these competitions and be the judges for that. And then the way that you kind of make you upgrade that system would be you're coming to California or wherever HQ is going to be. And we're going to take you through a seminar every single year so that you know exactly what to expect and plan out the competitions beforehand. So you know what you're judging. Don't have the judges kind of blind to what's going to be tested. Show them what it should look like from the people that are writing the competitions. Along those lines, that's only possible if you have a set of professional judges, because if, if you have just say volunteer judges, for example, and you give them the workouts three weeks in advance, but you're not allowing the athletes to know what the workouts are in advance. There is a distinct possibility for those things leaking to certain subsets of athletes based on what you were saying. You know, you have fans of Noah. How likely is it that Noah isn't going to get a DM from that judge slash fan once he knows what the workouts are in advance. So it would require some sort of 
uh, professionalization of judging. Ryan, before we got on here, you were talking about the fact that, and, and I actually didn't know this, but the NFL judges or the NFL referees are, um, that's like not their full-time job. It's just right. something that they do like a week, almost a weekend job, but they're professionals in the sense that there's like training that they have to attend and, and things like that. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I think Brandon could probably speak a little bit more intelligently than I can, but I remember reading an article where they have a lot of these guys have very like, I don't know, prestigious jobs, like they're lawyers, um, CrossFit coaches, CrossFit coaches. <laughs> the most prestigious, the most jobs. prestigious job, imaginable. <laughs> but, but they're making good money. And this is something that they do because it's a passion of theirs. And then like they're walking off the field and having beer thrown on them. <laughs> yeah. Again. There's like, that, there's that problem again of volunteering to have objects I mean, thrown at you. <laughs> they are getting paid, but I don't think that it is their sole source of income and right. it is not their job year round to be as good at that job as possible, which is odd when you consider the revenue stream that the NFL has. They're getting paid well. I mean, most of, I think the, the average salary is like 175,000 for those 16 games that they're in the NFL. And then they, most of them, I, I think the requirement is you must have another job title. That was kind of the right. way that they wanted it to be so that you're not getting in other words, you're not getting paid off by players or something like that right. to, you know, cheat or whatever it may be, but they do go through a, a very rigorous system of these are the standards here. They're basically quarantined themselves before the season so that they can see all the upgrades, to the standards. Here's what it's going to, what a holding penalty looks like. Here's what a face mask penalty should look like. Here's what pass interference. Here's what a catch should look like this year. And they're always going through that stuff. And they also are graded. So like, if you do a bad job, you're fired, you're out of well, there. Uh, along those same lines, like, now I'm starting to see a system that could could evolve here. So if HQ employs a group of professional judges, now I, I do think you, you brought up they're paid like 170 something. Obviously right. our sport doesn't have that kind of money. Like it's just not on on the table. But one thing that you just mentioned is like they, they go through and they show what you like a holding. probably send these people a packet of fit aid. Rogue. Yeah. No, you give them a free rogue barbell. Right. That's, that's, hey, that's like $500, man. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good thing, right? You yeah. get a free barbell and then each time you do it, you judge an event, you get a new plate. So you start with 25 pounds and then you can, <laughs> I got upgrade. one side, it's I like got one twenty five over here. It's like the karate belt system. You know what I mean? You, get, you got the green plate, you got the blue <laughs> plate, you got the red plate, and then you get the little change plates when you're, you know, for the, the tips. Uh, <laughs> Just no. So essentially you, you bring your professional judges in and, and at the end of the season and you say, okay, these are the new standards we're going to uphold. Then you take all your video from previous years where judging standards weren't weren't upheld on the live competition floor. So you take the games, although this year's games, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be much, it's, it's going to be a little different because it's going to be, uh, you know, it, not in person for the most part, but you take the previous year's stuff, you go back and review like, this is a no rep. This is why it was a no rep. And you educate your judges. Then you give them some sort of screening and you eliminate the ones that aren't good. Yeah. Right. There's, there's the beginnings of the system for starting to create professional judges that get better every single year versus what we've seen up to this point. Yeah. I mean, I think you could also look at like a pool, like, Hey, I want to be a judge at the CrossFit games instead of just being like, I sign up to volunteer to judge at the CrossFit games or volunteer at mid Atlantic or Wadapalooza. Like, Hey, you need to go get graded at a local competition where you volunteered to judge for that day. And if you don't grade at above a certain percent, then you're just not invited to come judge at these sanctionals. If you're not willing to hand out no reps when they're warranted, if you're not, or if you're over enforcing standards, which is another thing that we do see on occasion is like, your job isn't to make me look like Noah when I move, it's to make me meet the minimum standard. I would be the worst judge imaginable in this. <laughs> um, That's a no rep because it's ugly. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it though. Like I've seen, yeah, no, you're, I've you're seen someone right. no rep a deadlift because they deadlifted with a rounded back. Like, Nowhere in the standard is that a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, just creating a system where like you're not allowed to jump more than from local to sanctionals. And then you jump from sanctionals to the games, assuming you grade out as one of the top 40, 50 judges or whatever the case may be. No, yeah. So I, that's a great system. So big picture would be that there needs to be standards for the judges as well, right? Yeah. Like we, we hold all of our athletes to a high standard and we're trying to test fitness. Well, the same thing with our judges. So to me, I think having some form of paid 
judging system in place makes sense. So like hire your elite judges. If it's only 12 or 15, that, that that's what they get paid for. And it doesn't have to be a, a yearly salary, but something so that we can have a system in place that we know these are the same judges year after year. And then they're still graded by the standards that we have in place. And if they're missing a lot of no reps or they're giving a lot of no reps that aren't, then they're fired. Like that's just, that's how a, any other job works. Like if I'm not doing my job, Max fires me, right? Like that's just kind of the nature of, of what we Fred, do in life. Please continue to do your job so you don't get fired because I want you to hang around. <laughs> no, no, Max, please. But I think that that's just the way that we have to look at it. And so I, I kind of want to turn the conversation because this is what we're going to see in a couple of weeks is online competition. Yeah. So it's going to be different for the games athletes because they'll have a judge on site. But how do we enforce standards or what do we do in an open style environment or qualifier style environment when judges are friends? Well, I think let's look at this problem from the top down. So first off, what's the purpose of the open? The pur purpose of the open is to identify the fittest on earth and get them qualified, honestly, through to the games because yep. you have these automatic qualifying spots where people don't have to go compete in person. I think that's a, another problem that we could discuss on another podcast, but so like, let's look at this. Okay. We need to figure out how to make sure that these top 20 athletes are upholding the standard. Well, first off, how do we do that? I think we need to take those professional judges or we need to take a subset of judges and have them watch all five videos or all five workouts, all those top 20 athletes that's doable. And then, you know, you start to eliminate and, and this is sort of the system they've got. The only problem I think that exists with this is when they are doing their internal review, none of that information is public. And I think the information no. should be at just as public and available to the athletes. When you get a major penalty, they should be able to explain to you exactly why, where it happened and not just say there were too many no reps. Yeah. There should be a screencast of those no reps. And this Absolutely. is something that we actually talked about last year when we had some people get no reps on, on certain things. And I don't know what they do again in MLB, but in the NBA and the NFL, on, so like in the NFL, they have their Sunday games on Monday. We're well really on Tuesday because they have the Monday night game. They release all the bad calls and all the good calls from that week. So they are very transparent. I'm sure they're still hiding stuff, right? Like, don't yeah, get me sure. wrong. Yeah, Every yeah. organization does. But it's but a lot more transparent than what we have. For currently. sure. They, they show you the play and they say, this should have been a pass interference or this shouldn't have been. And they tell you exactly what is going on. The same thing with the NBA of, no, that was a good call. That was a bad call, whatever it may be. So that would be the first step, releasing that so that we can see. And it doesn't have to be with the person that finished 20,000th. We're just talking about like these top 20 men, women, and teams need to be looked at. And then let's have a real discussion about the objective standards that we have in place. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think if we want to continue to professionalize the sport and get more, you know, sponsorship money and get more viewership. And, and honestly, if you look at what, uh, Eric Rosa said, like get more people involved in the open, then there needs to be more, uh, clarity. There needs to be more objectivity. There needs to be more transparency in all of the system or else people are just going to get frustrated and want to quit. Yeah. I mean, one other thing that we have to think about when we're looking at the open specifically is, where is the 20th place guy finishing on his worst finish or where is anybody finishing on their worst finish? And we need to have a system. Maybe it's the community judges, those people, but we need to have a system to where everybody who finished above someone in the top 20 gets judged as well. Because if you remember a workout like 19.1, like if you've got 50 guys on a Z-Bex rower, just like crushing it because yep. it's 30 seconds per round and they're getting in front of somebody. I know Noah missed qualifying straight to the games that year because of that workout. So if he loses out on his spot because you had those 30 guys and then you had another 50 who weren't squatting to depth, like that's not really fair to him. Yeah, you would have essentially taken away the second fittest man on earth's game spot because that because people in between him and where he needed to be cheated the standard. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I'm not sure how you solve that problem because it could be hundreds of videos that need to be reviewed in that case. Yeah, so one of the things that I've suggested in the past, and I know that this is challenging to do, but it, it could be done, is you whatever that number may be, let's say the top thousand in every single workout must submit a video, but it's in an online forum where as soon as they submit their score, the video has to be linked. Other competitions have done this, right? Yeah, right. And then it is a community-based judging standard first, where it's just an upvote or a downvote. So in other words, if I'm watching your video, Kyle, and I see a couple no reps, I say, well, that's f five or more, whatever the major penalty is. I just put a downvote. That's all. I'm not giving you anything else. Man, did you just downvote me? <laughs> Actually, I would give you three upvotes. <laughs> but then let's say if that person had more than 10 downvotes in their workout, 
that's when the paid judge would go and review that workout. And that's what they're paid for, right? So the community is still doing the policing for the most part. And look, there are trolls. There, there are always going to be trolls in CrossFit. And so you're going to have people that downvote or upvote for no or reason. Fans. Or fans. Yeah. Fans that vote. Fans that can yep. upvote for yep. sure. Yeah. But at least then we get a standard in place that, hey, there, there are 150 downvotes on this video. Let me see why. Or if someone has a thousand upvotes and zero downvotes, maybe they want to see that too. It seems very strange that they don't have any downvotes, right? But then the, the paid judges can look at that. And then the top 20 on every workout is mandatory. The paid judges are reviewing those videos and multiple paid judges are reviewing each of those videos. I love the idea of the system. And then of course, the next question is where does the money come from to pay for the judges and, right. and all that stuff? But I, I think if the sport has a way forward as a professional sport, then I think coming up with these solutions is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, look, if you want to be a legitimate sport, you have to put some money into it. Right. Yeah. And I think they've done a really good job of that. And I think that the new infrastructure they have in place is willing to listen to, to people. And so hopefully they're listening to this. Like, like I mean, look, every other sport has legitimate judging system that they are paid and their, and their athletes know what the standard is. Every, we'll put it this way. Every other major sport, does. Every other major sport. And, right. if, and that's what CrossFit wants to become exactly. is a major sport. So yeah, if you want to be a legitimate sport, that, that's the way I'll put it, not even major sport. Yeah. Every legitimate sport has a paid judging system in place and their athletes know the system before the season starts. Absolutely and if we true. can't get there, then we will never be a legitimate sport in my eyes. I know that's my opinion and people are going to get upset at that, but that's the next step to, to growing the sport and bringing money into the sport so that more people can make a living off of it and more people can enjoy it because it's a blast watching, you know, Frazier and Noah go head to head. I want to see more of that, but we need more athletes like them get into the sport. And if there's no money in it, people won't come into the sport. Not only that, there's nothing more frustrating as a fan or even an athlete watching one of your, your fellow competitors get a no rep on the, you know, like they're one inch over the line, but they're clearly over the line on that handstand walk yep. and they get sent back 25 feet. Like there's nothing more frustrating than watching that happen. And it definitely can leave a really bad taste in people's mouths, spectators, athletes, everybody that just kind of drives people out of the sport. Yeah. One of the other things I wanted to bring up, and this is kind of a touchy subject, but I, I mean, we never really touched on this last year after the games. Should there be recourse from coaches and athletes for when we think judging standards were failed at the highest level of the sport? So I'll just kind of say this, and this is not enough. Like, I know that they made the decision and it's a final decision. Frazier's bag falls out because he right. didn't zip it up. They said before that, that it was like a five minute penalty. He was given a 40 second penalty, whatever it is. I, I should actually have the numbers before I brought this up, but I just think it's important to kind of throw these out there. If he had a five minute penalty, it would have changed the course of the entire games. Not to say that he doesn't, I mean, look, he's the fittest guy in the world. There's no doubt about it. But my question is, and for those that are listening in the audience, what would have happened if that was someone else? Would they have been given the same standard if it was the guy that finished in 35th place? Well, what would have happened if, if, it, if it was someone else? It did happen to Morad. Morad stopped, picked up his sandbag and put it back in the bag because yeah. that was what they were instructed to do. Well, th that, so that happened. Obviously, Will did the right thing. If Fraser's probably focused. He didn't even, if he, he said he didn't see it fall out, which I, I believe, yeah, whatever. Sure. Like, it, it, that's fine. I'm not saying that he cheated. That, that's, look, and he doesn't need to. Like, that's what I'm saying. He yeah. is as good as, he's the best. But the question would be, I guess, does it change from person to person? And I guess my answer to that would be, it seems like it has in the past. So then how do we as athletes or the athletes union start bringing those things up too? Because I think, you know, we talk about this online standards and we talked about paying judges, but to me, this is kind of that third pillar of the foundation of all this is we need a fair and objective system. And it doesn't seem like that. It's the same thing with like Vellner and Noah both had bike malfunctions the year before that there was no recourse. There was no recourse at all. And, and for, I don't know what happened to Vellner's I'm guessing the chain broke well, maybe something similar to what Vellner, happened to Noah Vellner was in an like in, in an, an accident. accident yeah I think he ran into somebody or something like that so like it was equipment malfunction but I think that his was a little bit more self-inflicted user if error. I remember correctly yeah. um where Noah's was just like the bike just was yeah the pedal the pedal fell yeah. off they wasn't screwed in correctly and of course no one knows that and not to bring up like these these yeah. old wounds or whatever. But like, I guess my question is, this has happened to other people too, like that are outside of our organization that have been, I don't want to say screwed over, but things have happened that probably would have been different if it happened to someone else. My question is, is that how do we as an organization, how do we as coaches in general, like across all the CrossFit coaches that are in the sport or as athletes start having those conversations? Do you think we're able to do that now with this new infrastructure that's in place? Or is there something else that we should be doing for that? I think 
or I'm, uh, I'll put it this way. I'm optimistic that with the, the, the new infrastructure, as you put it, uh, that we will have the opportunity to start having these conversations. I hope that the athletes that they've brought in for the athletes union are the right ones to do it. I, I don't know any of them personally, so I can't speak to that, but I hope that they're willing to, to go out on a limb and just be honest with the leadership, the, the CrossFit, you know, games leadership to really move this sport in a positive direction. I hope so. Yeah. I can't speak to it. I, um, I don't think that you can do much about equipment malfunction. Like, I think that that's just a reality of our sport. Like you're bringing out barbells, you're bringing out plates, the rowers, like something is bound to go wrong when you're dealing with any sort of mechanical thing or technological. So thing. would you say as like the, so Castro and, and Rosa, whoever's making those calls at the end of the day is just like, we're sorry that happened to you, but it, it happened. Yeah, I, okay. I think so. And like, some of it is just like owning it. Like, Hey, we're sorry that, you know, our field wasn't evenly distributed when we were pushing our sleds. We're going to make an adjustment for next year. Um, but when you start coming to enforcing standards, I think that that has to be as black and white as possible. If you get caught, like, not meeting standards, it needs to be enforced. Or, or if a rule is laid out before an event, like here's the penalty, then the penalty is applied across the board, regardless yeah. of your, yeah. I mean, you could maybe have some like stipulations in there is that like, Hey, if, if the standard is you have to finish with the ruck and for whatever reason, like you can show on video that I accidentally like flipped up your bag or something and that knocked out one of the bags and like, Okay, fair enough. Oh man, that would be so but, much more entertaining if it was oh, like death match out there where awesome. I could just like throw people's bags off. I would, that's the only way I could win. Ripping people back by the <laughs> yeah. backpack as you go. But, but, but do you think that if the rig fell apart when he was doing pull ups versus the bike breaking, they would have still been like, sorry, the road guys didn't screw it together, right? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if everybody heard that. Chris said, what, what happens if it was the rig that fell apart while they were doing pull ups? Let's say, like in the, uh, what was the workout they did? Mary? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. They did yeah. Mary is 20 minute AMRAP. So Noah's winning. And then, and then all of a sudden the, last, the rig fell off. Yeah. The very last different. set the pull up bar plummets to the ground versus along the with bike. him versus the bike. Yeah. I, I Ryan, I kind of agree with you that it's a, there is like no good way to do that. So I honestly, I do not, I'm not saying that I have an answer for that. I do think though, that when you lay out standards beforehand, you just have to hold to them because that, again, like that, that's the point of having objective standards. Now with that said, I will admit that I think that the actual time lost in that workout was correct for how they penalized Frazier. Okay. I don't, I don't like that's where he was. He, that was his performance. And if he didn't know, he didn't know. But again, it, it goes back to, for me, if that was someone else, they would have said that's a five minute penalty or whatever the standard was beforehand. Sure. It, that's just kind of the nature of it. And, and I get it. They need him there and everything else. And that's not me calling out CrossFit games. It happens in a lot of sports like that. You know, they protected Lance Armstrong when people <laughs> knew that he was doping all that time, not to, not to complain doping two. and dropping a sandbag out of your ruck, just to be clear. But people protect those that are the, the pr high profile athletes in your sport. And so I get it. At the same time, we need to start th having those conversations and then hopefully change it for the better. I think my takeaway here is let's have a system for recourse when shit goes wrong. So for example, a, a pedal falls off a bike rather than just blanket, having a blanket statement that says, we're sorry, or you know, the, the rogue guys don't screw the uh, pull up bar under the rig correctly. Instead of saying the only option saying, we're sorry, at least have a system for coming up with a recourse. Even if that system just ends with, we're sorry, having a system that makes the athletes feel like they have something that they can do to deal with, uh, problems that are outside of their control, I think would be a, a positive thing for our sport. Yeah. What, uh, what do you guys think about the potential of an athlete disagreeing with a no rep and just saying, I'm going to continue working out and then you can video review. And if you video review, then you like, I either get removed from the competition uh, dude, that happened at Brazil. I'm like, is that, I don't want to bring up old wounds. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. But I watched that happen. Uh, I, I watched one of my athletes miss a game spot this past year as a result of that exact thing. We went back, like the videos are all available, right? I mean, it's all YouTube live. Mm -hmm. You can go back and look at it. And he got hosed so bad as a result of the, of what someone else did because they the continued. Oh man. So it's the sandbag, the row sandbag over the shoulder workout from Brazil. Josh is, I think Josh was winning the overall event. At, Josh, Miller? Josh Miller was winning the overall event at that point. And, uh, the, the athlete who was in second, 
he, he got time capped. So the way it worked is like you, you'd row and then you have to go do a certain number of sandbags. I think it was like two, then four, then six and eight, then 10 within a time cap. And the athlete got clearly time capped. He had to have his sandbag. He had to move it past a red line and then run to a platform to before the, the time cap to move on to the, the round of 10. And when the clock clicked, he hadn't moved his sandbag and he hadn't gotten to the platform, but he argued with his judge at that point and said, no, I made it. I made it. I made it right. Went back, did the last round, ended up finishing it. Josh ended up as a result of that. Uh, he still, he still won that workout, but at the end of the day, you know, he missed the, the games by like eight points and that would have capped the athlete who was in second by, you know, they would have been like 15th in that workout. And Josh would have been easily the winner of the Brazil sanctional this past year and would be competing in the CrossFit games in three weeks. Yeah. I think the, the big question there is how do we get a replay system in place that's similar to where other sports have theirs, right? So doing it even at sanctionals is going to be challenging just based on video. And, you know, they only, they're usually only watching those that are at the top, right? Like I'm yeah. first place and I'm in the last heat, but at the games or at a, if it is regionals again, they can set up to where there's camera systems in each lane and at least be able to see those no reps, good reps, whatever it may be, and then have replays for that. I think a big challenge here is, so Josh is in the situation where he knows that, uh, the athlete in second basically like, I don't want to call it cheated, but, but basically got away with something. Josh knows that we have the video. I mean, we can literally go back on YouTube and, and look at it, but is Josh going to be the asshole that's like, Hey, you need to go back and review his stuff because this isn't right. You know, can Josh make a, can Josh make a complaint? Well, if there's a replay system, is, then, then we could have that conversation, right? Yeah. Because that's not in place. It's very challenging for an athlete to do that. And they still have like, you know, when regionals was still a thing, we had a couple instances with, with other athletes where we asked for replays and they denied and whatever, but they, they have that capability with the cameras that they have in place. The question is, can we get them to do that? And then say at all CrossFit sanctioned events, we have cameras in each lane for the elites because we can't ask that for everything, right? But for right. the elites that we are going to replay if there are questionable reps or if you have a complaint and then you can file these or whatever it may be. I think that's the conversation that we need to have because like we could always go back. It's the same thing talking about the game stuff. Like th there's no way that we can go back and talk about it. But for me and what we said at the beginning of this conversation was how do we make judging better so that we can make the sport better. And to me, making an objective measure for all things judging allows us to get to the point that we want to be in the sport. I, I well, couldn't agree thoughts, with that more. Uh, I think my closing thoughts are, are just gonna be a quick summary of, of some of the things we talked about. So first off, professionalization of judging. So HQ taking ownership and hiring some professional judges that and creating a system for upgrading their judging. Number two, creating a system for upgrading movement standards per year rather than rewriting them every single year or assuming that they're already good enough. And having that conversation with our athletes, right? The top athletes need to be in on those conversations of movement standards so that they can help guide the process. So we can say these are easier to judge, but also test fitness just as well. And then I think the last one is probably application of standards across the board. So what, if we were to quantify what good judging is, it's consistent application of the standards. That's what good judging is in the end. Agreed? Yeah, for sure. And we're done with another podcast here. Corpus Animus podcast. Kyle dun, Root. Dun, yeah, dun. talk about it. Yeah, it was great today. I, All right, Ryan, uh, I really enjoyed what thing. we did today. It was great. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yep. Come on, sing a little <laughs> yep. bit there. I don't really know yep. what to say right now. Don't be shy. Thank you, guys. <laughs>